Hey there, I am Dr. Dave. A short time ago, I did a live classroom on the beginner's guide to species, strains, and varieties of magic mushrooms. It went really, really well, so I'm actually turning this into a podcast episode today. There's a little bit of an intro, so if you really don't want to hear the intro at all, you can go ahead and fast forward about eight minutes in, but I advise you check out everything because it's a really, really good episode, and you really don't want to miss anything at all. Okay, see you on the other side. Enter the world of magic mushrooms with microdose you. Hey there, I am Dr. Dave, Dr. David Maddow, and welcome to our classroom tonight. I really appreciate everybody that's here. It's awesome group already. Um, the title of our class, or the name of our class, I should say, is Species, Strains, and Varieties of Magic Mushrooms. And I'm going to be bringing, in just a few seconds, I'm going to be bringing my co-host, Dr. Denise Moret, on. You know her. She's been on the other, uh, in the other classes, on the other webinars, and then very shortly after that, we'll be bringing on Janelle Michael Isaac, and she's our guest and our expert tonight to talk about the different species, strains, and anything you want to know about magic mushrooms, because you can ask your questions here, and we're going to go ahead and answer, try to answer as many as we can. Just to, just to let you know, those of you that are brand new and don't know anything about me, um, my, again, my name is Dr. David Maddo. I have been microdosing magic mushrooms for a little over three years now, and the reason I began is because I was going through some mental health issues, such as anxiety and depression, and even a little bit more, some remnants of PTSD for some issues that I had. And I tried everything, you know, all the conventional things, talk therapy, um, pharmaceuticals, all the stuff they tell you to do. And it, it worked okay. It worked all right, but I didn't just want all right. I wanted my life to be back the way it should be, feeling really, really good every single day. And um, it's not an overnight fix, but I will tell you, um, since I began my microdosing regimen, I can tell you every day I feel absolutely fantastic and my life is as good or probably better than it was when I first before I started so um, that's why we're here um, I've dedicated my life now since it's worked so well for me I've dedicated my life to helping others and just sharing my story and I want to make it very clear before we get going that nothing that we talk about nothing that I talk about nothing that Dr. Denise talks about or nothing that Janelle talks about is to be taken as medical advice please consult your own doctor with your health care. We're just sharing our stories and our experience, but this is not to be taken as medical advice. And also, please be safe and use um, this sacred plant medicine only in an area where it is legal or where it is decriminalized. We just want you all to stay safe. We want you just to, you know, we want this to work for you, um, but we want you to stay safe as well. So having said that, I think I am going to Bring on Dr. Denise. Let me see if I can do that. Dr. Denise, make sure you unmute your video and let's see if this works. Welcome, Dr. Denise Moret, my friend, my colleague, my co-host, and probably a lot more. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. Thanks for having me. You know, I am uh, always say that I'm so um, excited. It sounds silly. I repeat myself, but particularly for our um, webinar class tonight, just the bringing together of your experience uh, my history and experience, and then the expertise of Janelle, who's also a friend and just so thrilled to have her here tonight. And for anybody who doesn't know me, I am a doctor of psychology. I've been practicing for over 30 years. Um, and I um, certainly believe that psychological work helps people. And yet I have known for a very long time, way back when I was in graduate school, that um, it was really falling sh far short of the mark. And I've known for a very long time that psychedelics really um, could potentially heal things, whereas a lot of the psychiatric medications don't heal, um, although they can be useful. So um, I've worked in um, certainly in psychological practice, trauma, depression, anxiety, all of those things. And I've also embraced a more complementary medicine approach where I've looked at plant medicines. And uh, even though you know we say mushrooms aren't really plants, but that has included the use specifically of microdosing psilocybin. So, um, and it has changed my work. It has changed the people I help, family, friends, patients, and it has also changed my own life um, in terms of my own um, treating, you know, residual issues that I was having. So 
Um, just thanks again for having me. Thanks for being here. And I will say this right off the bat that um, basically everything I do, is I do this um, out, out of, from my heart and my podcast, our private Facebook group, my e e email newsletter. However, I will say that Dr. Denise Moret and I have gotten together and collaborated and we have a program for people that um, just want some one-on-one -on -one hand holding. Um, in other words, you want to get started. You just don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. You've got something that may be something that's a little bit more complex and you want just some people to talk to and be uh, able to talk to anytime you want and have a, um, a program that, that we, we help you through the entire thing. So we do have that available. We're not going to really do, be doing any kind of commercial for that tonight, but you know how to get me. Um, and if you're interested in that, it, it, like I said, it is a paid program. That is not a free program, but it is uh, the people that we've had that have gone through this so far. Um, basically, it's nothing short of life changing. Uh, everyone that's gone through this has said it's it's well worth not not only well worth it, but worth much more than they ever thought as they were getting into that. So again, if you're interested, you know how to get me. Um, just we don't push this on anybody, but there are people out there that we've helped and and wanted help wanted one on one. So just just let us know. The other thing is, um, again, before we bring Janelle on, let's test out the chat box. So if everybody could just okay got Monica from Louisiana. We got, let's see, Birmingham, Glenn from Birmingham, Boston, Los Angeles, Florida, Nashville, Minneapolis, Portland, Guadalajara, Buenos Dias. That's all I got. Ryan, SLC, baby. Oh, that's, that must be near me somewhere. Michigan, San Diego. Now we're working. Now we got it going, everybody. Okay, sorry about that. So sorry that it wasn't working. But now we, sometimes we just got to get some kinks out and I'm going to learn for next time what I did wrong. But okay, I think we're good there. Um, also, one more thing before I bring Janelle on is I want to thank any of you, all of you who have been on the Patreon page. The Patreon page is a way a lot of people say, well, I want to support you in some way, and we don't really take donations or anything, but the Patreon, uh, well, I'll always take them, but uh, we don't ask for them. But the Patreon page is a way to get, um, to give us a small, don a very tiny donation every single month. And for that, in return, you get a very, very small group of um, premium Nakama that uh, basically when you're there and we're all there, anything gets answered almost right away. We do some premium content for you all. And the way you get there is simply, let me see, somebody, if somebody could put this in the chat box, I would really appreciate it, but it's Patreon, patreon.com slash microdose you, and that microdose you obviously is one word, which is the letter U. Gina from Baltimore, Ryan, woohoo, Kaylee from Mexico. We got a lot of Mexicans here. Done. This is great. We're international. So whoever just did that spelled Patreon wrong, I'm sorry, it's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Patreon. E-O-N. It's, it's, there you go. Uncle Hashi got it right. Thank you, Uncle. Um, so there's the link right there if anybody else wants to put it. Um, I really appreciate anybody joining us on Patreon. And again, for your small, small monthly donation, you will get, you'll get us up close, personal, and some really premium content. Dr. Denise just did a, um, a really nice video on it um, late last week. And we got more and more and more stuff good coming on Patreon. So please, Join us there if you can. Now, okay, the moment you've all been waiting for, I want to bring on Janelle Michael Isaac. So Janelle, go ahead and unmute. There she is. Ben, before you, um, I'll just, Janelle, I'll just bring you on. And what I'd like you to do is just um, give us a brief introduction about you, what you do, and then we'll get going with some questions for you. And then what we'll do is once we do that, we'll open it up for questions from all attendees because it's a, it's a really, it's, it's, I'd say people asking about different um, varieties, strains, um, species, things like that. Well, not, they don't, they're not asking for different species, but people are asking like, what type? So we're going to get into all this tonight. It's going to be great. So Janelle, thanks so much for being here. Come on and, and just say hello and introduce yourself to everybody, please. Hey, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming on tonight um, to join us. I'm Janelle. Um, I am not a scientist, doctor, uh, mycologist, or anything of that nature. They've already disclosed all of this um all of my evidence is based on personal experience and um you know talking to other people about their experiences and a lot of research so um my background i have i was a cannabis educator a theologist 
So I had some background working with plants, but I became interested in mushrooms, specifically magic mushrooms, when I was reading the Johns Hopkins study saying mm -hmm. that it could aid in the help of treatment resistant depression, uh, moderate anxiety disorder. So I tried other pharmaceuticals and did not have any luck and was already using medicinal cannabis. So I figured why not? Um, and when sourcing consistently became an issue, my husband and I decided to start growing them. So we grew them for a while and I was giving them to people and, you know, using them myself to heal. And um, I found that I was able to essentially heal from most of my treatment resistant depression, generalized anxiety disorder. Of course, everyone has ups and downs and that kind of thing. But I found that um, based on my personal experience, I wanted to help other people learn how to utilize them. Um, and much like cannabis, there's a lot of misinformation about mushrooms out there. There's not a ton of good research and studies. And um, so I'm grateful to be a part of this podcast to come in and answer any questions. Um, well, yeah. thank you, Janelle. Thanks again. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule and being here this evening. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you your first question, but I want to make sure that everybody that's viewing this, um, if if something comes to your mind while I'm asking Janelle a question or while she's speaking, um, go ahead and it, make sure you do it in the Q&A box, though. That's very important. That's where we're going to be looking for questions. Um, just write your question down. We will try our very best to get to as many as possible. Can't promise every single one, but um, as something comes to your mind, write it down in the Q&A as a Q&A, and we will certainly try our best to get to it. So, Janelle, let's just get right started right off the top. Um, we'll... we'll, we'll be real basic at first um we have some people here that are not experienced at all and then others who are much more experienced as anything in between so let's just start off by i'm going to ask you what exactly is a psychedelic mushroom and then as you give your definition and talk a little bit about psychedelic mushrooms i'd like you to go into a little bit more depth and talk about um the difference between species and I know some people get these terms kind of confused. That's why I'm going to ask you this. That species, um, subspecies, strains, varieties. There's so many other things, so many things that people are talking about, about these different types of mushrooms. So let's make sure everybody's really clear. So go ahead and, and um, that'll be a chunk, a little chunk of a couple of questions for you there to get started with. So great. <laughs> um, Psychedelic mushrooms are considered anything that is like mind altering, um, has psychedelic compounds in it. There's tons of species. There's actually tons of genuses. Um, most of the hallucinogenic mushrooms fall into the um, psilocybe family, though, um, although we do have other families with different alkaloid groups like Amanita muscaria is more widely known around the world for its mind altering um, effects. It has a rich history in other places. Um, but more commonly, people use psilocybe species because it's more accessible to them. It's more easy to cultivate um, and it's found around the world as well. Um, so within that species, there is quite a few, um, there's quite a few psychedelic mushrooms. Um, the psilocybe species had or the philosophy genus has the most of the active alkaloids so those are the primarily the ones that we use um some of the other ones are actually toxic so we don't want to use those for microdosing um but the philosophy uh species um has i'm sorry that's the genus and the species is cubensis so within the species psilocybe there's also a ton of other uh of uh species of mushrooms um we mostly like i said hear about cabenzas due to the cultivation but there's um there's also um tons like the azorescence are up to four times as strong as cubenzas they grow naturally um there's also sem semlent i'm sorry i'm mispronouncing this it's commonly called liberty caps uh, psilocybe semilantia. Um, there's also uh, psilocybe cyanescence, there's tampanensis, and they all have varying degrees of the same alkaloids that are mind altering. So that's what makes them different within the same species, cubensis. There's tons of different varieties. 
people cultivate them, people find them throughout the world, but technically they're all the same species, cubenses within the genus Psilocybe. Okay, cool. And I don't remember the exact number, but I've heard that there are like many, maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Janelle, but maybe hundreds of um, subspecies of the, um, I'm glad you said psilocybe because um, that's that's also a, a very commonly mispronounced word. So psilocybe cubensis, there are a lot of uh, like sub subspecies. So I want to ask you, um, what are some of like the absolute most common subspecies uh, that we should all be familiar with know about and and maybe the names should be should, should we should understand um you know the properties of them but give us maybe a handful of like the absolute most common ones that we should all know sure um so i have a list here somewhere of um sorry so cubenses there's tons you're right there's hundreds and technically like people are isolating new ones all the time and so it's going to continue to grow as cultivation is more of a hobby um so a lot of times these species or these subspecies of cubenses are named based on where they're found growing in the world um, some examples of that popular ones would be like mazatopec burma amazonian um, Tampanenses, um, there's, there's a ton, Koh Samoy, um, those are all like, oh, Malabar is another big one, um, named on location they're found in the world. Some of the other more popular ones we see are isolations, um, like Penis Envy, that one has a funny name, but it's named due to its phallic appearance. Um, someone was able to isolate that characteristic and replicate it, so, that was named based on that. The other things are named due to the person that grew them or the person like Maria Sabina is an important figure in the psychedelic movement. She has a, a variety named after her. Um, and so they're all describing different characteristics, but some other common ones would be like, be positive, hillbillies is, is becoming kind of more popular. Um, one of my favorite, Jedi Mindfuck, that one's pretty good. Um, there's... <laughs> There's tons though, and people are naming new ones constantly. What would you say, or if you had to give us maybe the the, the three or four, if that's fair, the three or four most common, because I know one you didn't mention, um, and I hear about this all the time, and it's also, I think, one that's recommended for people that are starting, um, golden teachers. So what would be, if you had to give like a, a three or four of your favorite starting, starting uh, uh, sub, sub, subspecies, what would you, what would you say? Well, for starting, uh, you're right, the golden teachers are super popular for starting. Um, and I believe the reason for that is the characteristics they possess. They have a little bit of less of a psilocybin and psilocin alkaloid content, making them a little more of a gentle mushroom or a little more forgiving. Like I could probably take a quite of a large dose of a low psilocybin containing uh, psilocybe cubenses and have a more, you know, uplifting, maybe a little more creative, less heavy feeling kind of experience. Um, and so that might be desirable for some people. Um, but I, I really, it's hard to name certain ones that I think are best because they all share the same active components. Um, I, I mentioned this one earlier, JMF, that one tends to be pretty potent. And so I like that one personally. Um, tends to just the amount I typically take with that one, I tend to feel it a little more. It's a little more strong. So a little more euphoric for me based on that. Um, and Enigma, I should mention Enigma. I really enjoy Enigma. It's a mutation um, and it's really, really potent and really kind of a beautiful, it looks like it grows in like a coral, almost like a brain structure. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to go to my second question, actually, Janelle, just based on how the flow of the conversation is going. And we talk, you know, you're talking a lot and we talk a lot about the experience that people have based on like, do you take Enigma or Golden Teachers? And I've certainly experienced the same. And I know that the type, you know, really does have an effect on, um, you know, what we experience. And we also know that everybody's individual and we know we're very far from saying, take this 
medicine, this dose, and it's gonna be the same desired effect for everybody. We know that it's not like that. Um, we know research is happening all the time. And yet I really would be interested if you could speak a little bit about what um, you do know, because you do know a lot, like you just started to speak about Enigma and Golden Teachers and that you know variety. Um, you know, if you could say a little bit about, you know, do certain varieties, are they kind of more specific, for instance, like for if somebody's dealing with anxiety or depression or trauma or, um, you know, body, physical pain, or they're just like, I want to like expand my spiritual experience, et cetera. If you could say a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so with that one, again, it, it's a little difficult because I do think because they all have the same components, mostly it's, um, it's kind of more like the dose dependent, like, for example, for like a more spiritual kind of experience, I would say that maybe a little more than a microdose and you're, you put yourself in a setting where it's either like you're meditating or doing breath work or doing something beyond just taking a mushroom and expecting to connect spiritually. I like to go in the forest personally um, to take them and have like more of a spiritual experience in nature. Um, so something like that, or if you're looking for like anxiety relief or depression relief specifically, um, they found there's a microdosing institute protocol they found works best, which is dosing every other day, or say you're looking for focus, adding something like lion's mane, I think can be helpful versus like the, the type that you pick, because I think they all have the beneficial components just in varying levels. Thank, thanks for that. And it, it, the key thing that I just heard you say was that it's dose dependent more so. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a very important point that you could, as you mentioned just a few minutes back, that you could um, take a lot more of Golden Teachers than you would of, you know, the other, um, say, more potent um, you know, varieties. So I just have two other quick questions um, and maybe um, we could sort of take them together, but the, the, the role of alkali, alkaloids, you said active alkaloids, and that's really a very key point that I wanted to just ask if you could just say a little bit more about that and, you know, kind of the significance of it, just a little bit. We don't have to have a chemistry lesson, but. Sure, absolutely. So um, in terms of the alkaloids, the active alkaloids that are found in all psilocybe cubensis species, um, every sub variety of that, um, they all contain psilocybin, they all contain psilocin, they all contain baocystin and something called norbaocystin. And then some of them have minor alkaloids called aruganesin and bufinin, um, or bufferin, I'm sorry. Um, but most of these alkaloids, when they are metabolized by the body, they all convert to psilocin as far as current studies show. Um, there aren't many current studies on like the, the alkaloids, the, the minor ones themselves, the baocystin and nor baocystin um, or the other minor alkaloids. Um, there aren't any studies that, indi that individualize their effects. They may have some role in modulating and, and interacting with synergy or whatever with the psilocybin and psilocin, but as far as science tells us right now, um, they're all digested and metabolized into psilocin, including psilocybin. So it's interesting because we hear more about psilocybin because it's a much more stable uh, alkaloid to work with. It's more, um, it doesn't oxidize as quickly. It's easier to synthesize. And so we read and we hear much more about psilocybin, but they all convert to psilocin as far as we know. So. Great. Thank you. And I like that you just mentioned the synthesized, you know, a lot of the research I'll just mention really quickly. We know a lot of the research uses synthesized as opposed to like, you know, what we're all using necessarily. And then the, the final quick question was um, really about like how, how easy is it to grow, you know, your own mushrooms? Um, would you recommend it um, to someone to do that on their own? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, just really quick getting back to the, um, the synthesize, the reason, the reason that they work with synthesized psilocybin is because it's much easier to measure 
the potency because they can vary up to four times. It, so it's it's hard for it to be as consistent unless you're synthesizing it to to have like a measurable amount every time for a consistent result. Um, but okay, then going back to growing mushrooms, um, I definitely encourage anyone who has any interest in growing to get into it. I know some people just are like, that's not my thing. Um, I won't necessarily say it's easy. It is kind of involved. There's definitely a process. Um, there's several different processes. You can find one that you really like, or you can find ones that you want to make modifications on and, and stuff, but there's a ton of info out there. And I think overall being able to grow your own medicine and have like a relationship with the, the things that you're consuming to like help you. And I, I think that's really magical, <laughs> you know, pardon my pun, but um, I definitely encourage anyone to get started growing and I can even name off resources if anyone needs any for that, like for, for starters, shroomery.org is a really good uh, website for information. Um, I personally like Peter McCoy's book, Radical Mycology. It has tons of information in there. There's some great Facebook groups, including Microdose U. That one's not growing focused though. Um, Ladies of Mycology, if you happen to be a lady or, or identify as a female. Um, or there's a Wombat Labs group I'd mention if you're male identifying or female. Um, and both of those groups, they have spores, they have tons of experienced and inexperienced people. So thanks so much, Janelle. And um before we get, we're gonna in a couple of seconds, we're gonna get into questions. We have a bunch of questions. So if you if anything came to your mind, please um make sure you put them in the Q&A box though, because it looks like a couple of you have actually started asking questions in the chat. Um, if you have, you can leave it there. I'll, I'll, I'll dig it up. I'll find it. But um, please put your questions in the Q&A box. But Janelle, before I take the first question, um, is there anything at all that we missed or that you want to just mention before we get into the, to the Q&A from our audience? Um, I always like to I always like to encourage anyone to get involved in decriminalization efforts locally, nationally. Um, there's still far too many people that are, you know, I could go off about the war on drugs and how it's failed us. But, um, you know, I think being an advocate when you can be for psilocybin is important and also like getting involved to decriminalize locally, especially if it's not legal or, you know, decriminalize where you're at. Perfect. Yeah, that that's that's really beautiful. I, I like that a lot. So um, everybody, listen to Janelle and, and do what you can because we we're kind of at the beginning of this. Uh, the every the world is changing now and for the better as far as as far as psychedelics and they've just they've just helped so many people with with uh, especially with mental health struggles. It's just it's just such a shame to know that um, you could really get in trouble if you're in an area that's not legal. It's just, it's, it's kind of sad, but we, we won't focus on that right now because we have a bunch of questions for Janelle. I'm going to start off with um, Therese has actually two questions. And the first one, um, she wants to know if um, you can show pictures of various types of species of mushrooms. Now, I don't know if, if you're set up for that, if you want to do a screen share, Janelle, but something, just keep that in your mind. If we could do that in a little, maybe not the second, but if you, if you can maybe work it in at some point, that would be pretty cool just to show a few pictures. But her main question is actually, um, she said, my orchard where I live has at least 20 different looking types of mushrooms. How can I tell the difference between toxic or psilocybin or psychedelic mushrooms um you're saying like locally like for foraging you're looking to tell the difference or it looks like it looks to me like the question where she lives uh her, where she lives there's there's um many different types of mushrooms just growing where she lives and she wants to know okay. how she can tell the difference between like a psychedelic maybe a, a, a just an edible mushroom in general or um something that might be toxic and, and be very dangerous so my recommendation for that, I don't have any like photos prepared, but I can share my Instagram link if you want. And I do share different photos of mushroom grows on there. Um, but uh, as far as identifying mushrooms, you definitely want to be able to properly identify them before you ever consider consuming them. And so I'm glad you asked, like, where do you get that information? 
Um, depending on where you live, there's tons of local guidebooks often that you can um, buy for identifying local edible and inedible mushrooms. Um, and then just going out and, you know, trying to identify what you found. Sometimes, you know, there's lots of characteristics. If you're taking a photo of a mushroom to identify, make sure you get a picture of the top of the cap, the underside where the gills are, you know, any kind of features it has. Um, because they have a lot of properties and even taking a spore print is sometimes required to properly identify them. Um, so uh, besides books, um, there's tons of also Facebook groups for local identification things. I'm a, I'm a part of ton in, of ton in Michigan. I went to a class recently about like foraging and which mushrooms are edible. And it's one of my big hobbies too. So like I'm into that thing, but like you learn a lot about them by just, you know, becoming proactive and trying to um figure it out like what is this thing can i eat it <laughs> yeah so some well, of them you can and they're delicious but you have to be careful you have to be careful denise before you ask your question because i know you're ready with one um i will add to that that sherry wrote in the chat box uh there's an app called picture mushroom that will tell you what kind of mushroom it is when you take a picture of it now i personally have no experience i can't I can't say it's good or bad, but it sounds it sounds pretty interesting. So you might want to take a look at that app called Picture Mushroom as well. Just just a side note, though, um, because there's so many features of mushrooms, and like I said, sometimes sometimes even a spore print um, is necessary for a positive ID. I inherently I don't always trust those apps. I've I've seen them misidentify things that I know, um, and so. Some of them can be good. I personally kind of like iNaturalist for that. It's usually pretty on, but again, I wouldn't like trust it. So, so um, I did want to, there was a question about, um, could we list all those growing sources again? So I'm going to say after the webinar, everybody's going to get an email that's going to have a lot of that information. And I think that's probably an easier way to have it as opposed to just saying it and people are trying to scribble it down. So um, it's pretty easy to find some of those things that you've mentioned um so um uh, and I, I, there was a question about how does someone begin to advocate and i'm a strong advocate and you know you can get very active in your state it's more of a state uh, by state thing at this particular point there are some federal things our current president actually and the fda for whatever that's worth are um certainly advocating for fast tracking approval because it has revolutionized the treatment of so many um, like, you know, re treatment resistant depression, as you mentioned, Janelle, et cetera, et cetera. So, but if you want to advocate, I know what I did in New York, there's a mental health advocacy group as a doctor, you know, in New York, you know, I could sort of join that. I could support that. There are often senators, congressmen, politicians. If you do a little clicking around and Googling, you probably find exactly, um, you know, where, where to got, kind of get connected and support those groups. Um, so my, um, there were lots of really great questions. So um, one was, could you say specifically about a more, um, especially for people trying to grow on their own, like the most, you know, the easiest, the, the least uh, troubling, um, you know, the question was, what's the most mold resistant contamination resistant um, that someone would want to start with? Okay, so that is a that can be an issue with mycology is contamination. And so you want to make sure you're getting your genetics from somebody who works in front of a flow hood, has, you know, clean genetics, works on agar to clean up their genetics to make sure there's no contamination. Um, and so yeah, um, buying them from a trusted source is is the best. And uh for me, starting out. I know I had a, a huge success with a random strain, Alicabenzi. Um, I purchased that randomly and I had a lot of success growing just big monotubs of it. Um, and so if you're looking for bulk, I thought that was a good experience. I've also had good luck with B positive as a strain. That one's known to be pretty resilient. And um, so, yeah, that and just, you know, be sterile and everything you're doing around them as much as possible. Um, I would personally avoid Uncle Ben tech or any of like the, the kind of cheat methods to grow mushrooms. Um, I see a lot of those and just stick to a sterile process. Thanks. Fantastic. I'm going to um, read this one because I want to make sure I get it. So it looks like a pretty cool question from Monica. 
And um, even though she said she came in a little bit late, are there different side effects from one strain to the other? So in other words, um, she says, I, re I will reduce the amount when I feel it coming on strong, but it almost feels like one strain may relax me. One takes me to the past every time and so on. So just different feelings with each. So is, is this a common subject that comes up with microdosing um, strain to strain, or, or if you want to call it subspecies, it doesn't really matter, but um, you know, different, different side effects or different effects. So the, so I did an experiment when I started growing because I had access to a couple different varieties at the same time. And I was kind of curious. I was like, oh, let me see if I can figure out which one's good that makes me feel creative, which one makes me in a good mood, like which one does this. And so I went down that avenue and I was trying to document everything. And, and I found that, you know, I, I found one variety like, oh, this makes me feel a little creative and uplifted. It was rusty whites in case anyone's wondering. Um, and I would take that and then I take it for like a few days in a row and then I'd have a different effect. I would notice like, Hey, I don't really feel creative today, but maybe it's cause my day is different, you know, or maybe I'm in a different mood to start with, or, you know, I started to notice that my set and my setting or like your mindset and your environment, um, had a little more to do with my experience than the type of mushroom that I was consuming. Um, there are differences, of course, in, in the different ones, but like I was saying, I, I think it's mostly due to the different psilocybin and psilocin content. Um, as of right now, there's not any studies that exist that, are, that pinpoint certain effects due to the minor alkaloids or which would be, you know, slightly different in different uh, varieties of the same strain or the same species, cubensis. So I'm not saying that they can't have different feelings. I just, according to my personal research and according to the science that exists, there's not really any known correlations. And everybody's different. Everybody, everybody's different in, in different strains and species, well, uh, subspecies and varieties act differently for different people. So let's, let's keep that in mind. There's, there's one other thing too, that it's not just even the genetics that are affecting the experience. It can be, you know, how the mushroom was grown, how it was dried, how it was stored, how old it is, the method that you consume it. So all of those things can also be factors. There's a ton of factors. Yeah. Factors is key. And, you know, it, I heard Paul Stamets say, like, we're so far from being able to say, this mushroom, you know, we've talked about this before. I mentioned it earlier, you know, that it's hard to do that. And because I don't know if we'll ever be able to say, um, take this, this much, and this is going to treat that, or you get that desired effect because of all the factors you're mentioning, Janelle, because, you know, you, you could take something and then a couple of days later, it's going to have a different sort of effect because everyone's unique and there can be so many layers, which is why we talk about all those different factors and layers. Um, there was one question, I'll just kind of quickly answer it if you want to chime in here, that um, about studies on brain health, mental health, like connected to psilocybin, microdosing, and there are lots of studies on that. And it's very positive, actually, um, you know, the idea that it's dangerous, that's why it's illegal, all of that is, is sort of a myth. So it is extremely, uh, there's lots of studies on that. In fact, people with strokes and the, the healing and Parkinson's and people doing better with a lot of neurological disorders because, you know, we really have to remember that mushrooms are very, uh, there's a lot of wisdom and they really can do a lot. I mean, if they, I always say if they can eat plastic, they can help us. Um, there was a question about, um, actually, I'll, I'll ask you two questions, even though they're, they're not related, but the dried versus fresh. Um, and then the other one was, you've mentioned the preference, somebody asked a question about the preference for Melmac. So um, two different questions, but um, together, even though they're not related, like, is it important to do dried versus fresh? What would be the difference? And then, you know, second unrelated question, your preference uh, statement about Melmac. Gotcha. Um, so dried versus fresh, when you're consuming a fresh mushroom, which I think are actually quite delicious. I'm not a fan of the dried mushroom taste, but the fresh ones, if you put them on like a salad or something, they're awesome. They contain a lot of water weight though. And so they say that when you dry it, 
you're losing about 90% of the water weight. Um, and so your dose is just going to be different as a result. Uh, fresh mushrooms are also higher in psilocin. And so you might have kind of a different experience because by drying the mushroom, you're converting a little bit of the psilocin. You're losing that. It oxidizes. Um, and so the fresh mushroom might have a different experience. But from my understanding, the rough conversion is like, say you're going for a one gram dose. You're trying to dose for one gram um, of dried weight. Say you're familiar with dried weight. Um, so that means that you would be taking 10 grams fresh would be like the 90% loss to equal about one gram dried. So it's, you know, it's, it's different and it might be a little more intense, like I said, because of the psilocin difference. Um, as far as Melmac goes, personally, I'm a big fan of that. It tends to be uh, somewhat potent, all things considered, compared to lots of other cubenses, and it's a really fast grower for us. Um, it has huge yields, and so that's it's it's been a preference for me, um, both to grow it and to take it, and I feel like it's just been kind of consistent. I will give Glenn a double because he has two questions that are somewhat related. Well, they're not maybe not related, but we'll we'll give him a, we'll give him two because they're both fairly short. So Glenn asks, um, first of all, what is the best way to store dried mushrooms, and how is the potency of the mushroom affected by the time it's um, by the time it's actually stored? And his second question is, do you find some species easier to grow than others, and which species do you find? have the most difficulty growing and what are the problems you encounter? Okay. So for drying mushrooms, storing them, um, it's best to store them away from air, away from moisture, away from heat, away from light. And so for me, that means like we, we vacuum and seal them and we put um, like the desiccant packs in with them to absorb any relative moisture um, and then we put them in a dark closet <laughs> and that's kind of been the mode. And as far as potency loss, the more they're exposed to air, the more they're going to lose their potency. And so um, basically if you're keeping them stored away, I've had mushrooms that still seem as potent like a year later. Um, mostly I don't sit on mushrooms that long, but I've done experiments for like, well, let's see. Um, or I've eaten like an old chocolate that I have and it still seems to pack a punch. So, um, I, yeah. So I think that's storage issues as far as growing, um, as far as growing goes species wise, Cubanzas, I do think are the easiest. Uh, we've tried to do some wood loving species like the cyanescents that grow outdoors and they eat wood chips instead of grain like Cubanzas. So they're a little different. Um, and I have not really had success there. Um, so I, I think Cubanzas have definitely been the easiest. Um, I, although we have done uh, tampanenses as well, which are like a truffle mushroom. And that seemed about similar it, it didn't really seem harder or easier um but we've also grown like or like uh lion's mane and oyster and stuff like that and they just require different techniques is mostly it so it's you know if you're used to sticking to one technique like cubes we we grow cubes because that's you know what's easiest <laughs> so great so um these are questions i really have no idea about and maybe you do so there was a question about um what do you, what's your opinion about Oak Ridge mushrooms? I've never even heard of that. Have you, and do you have an opinion? I'm, I'm guessing it's a mushroom company of some sort, but I'm not familiar with them. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and, and then I'll just sort of sneak in the second question, which is also about, you know, like if you're, and you sort of spoke about this and identification and it's really important. I know for people to never take chances, absolutely to, you see something, you think it's this, you think it's this, and it can look like so many different things. I know Paul Stamets is really an expert on this and he talks a great deal about it. And, you know, he offers a six month course on this actually that you could take. And so there was a question though, like how to tell the person had um, a lot of the brain structure mushrooms on their property and Oak Ridge is from Oak Ridge. It's a mutated mushroom grown. Okay, somebody answered that in the chat. Thank you. Um, 
so the the other question was about you know that the person's property has a lot of brain structure mushrooms and how could they tell if it's enigma you know so enigma doesn't grow outdoors it has to be cultivated it doesn't actually drop spores it's a mutation so that one actually has to be kept alive by live tissue culture and so it's kind of like a legendary variety in the mushroom community because that same live tissue culture is passed around to different growers and it's um it's gifted you know as like hey you you're doing things right in the mycology world. Here's Enigma or, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so I would 99.9 .9 guess any outdoor mushroom growing is not Enigma. Um, Enigma also has, uh, it's, it's albino and it's very blue bruising. So if it looks like a albino, icy white, blue, like blue brain, maybe, but it, it, it wouldn't survive outdoors in most of the, I don't know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to breed and, and live outdoors is what I'm saying. It can't reproduce itself. Here's a question that I know you can answer then, Janelle. Um, and the question is, how do we properly take a spore print? Ooh. Um, so spore prints are really cool. You can do it even with non-psychedelic mushrooms just for fun and art or whatever. Um, but uh, you would... I, I, when I started doing it, I would use tin foil. Now we use little glass Petri dishes, um, but you can use tin foil and just lay like a square of tin foil out. And then you want to cut the stem off the mushroom. And so you just have like the cap with the gills and you set it gill side down. And then they say to put a bowl over it, the top of it, because then it, the mushroom will kind of create its own humidity in there and, and do its thing. And I would say to leave it, I've always left it overnight, but I'd say maybe like 12 hours or so um, would be a proper, you know, a time for it to release its spores. Um, and then you pick up your mushroom and you have a little spore print on that tin foil. And if you're looking for this tin foil spore print to be sterile, you're going to want to take the spore print somewhere where it's not drafty. Um, you know, I, I shouldn't say sterile because it's exposed to the air. It's not. But then you can fold the tin foil back over it and kind of keep it a little more protected that way. Oh, I should say, too, that the mushrooms have to be like mature, like not every mushroom is ready for a spore print when they when the veil breaks and then like the mushroom starts to, you know, come upwards a little. Um, that's usually a good indicate indication. But um, the spores will darken to in a lot of in a lot of different types. Uh, so uh, two two questions. One I'm just going to answer really quickly, and then the other one I'll ask you, Janelle. One is the uh, question about the Amanita, a little more specific about the Amanita muscaria mushroom, um, and that it's supposedly toxic. And um, I would encourage people to look a, a lot of, and read about it. And there's some, um, you know, it is um, something that we're going to actually have another. Uh, we've asked Janelle to come back and come back and talk specifically about. Um, about that particular uh, mushroom, Amanita, which is um, a different kind of mushroom, but very um, useful and helpful. So um, it is known to be toxic, certainly, but it, it's actually, there's very good use for it in ways to have it that are, you know, take it and use it that are not toxic. It's very useful, actually. It's something I've really recently explored and, and I can say it's very helpful, but we're going to have another webinar on that. Um, so the question is, you know, the proper storage of mushrooms and do they need to get stored in the refrigerator? Um, I would, I would probably avoid storing them in the refrigerator. You, so there's been circumstances where I will like say that I'm in a circumstance where I am not going to fill the dehydrator and I'm like waiting for more mushrooms or like I'm not in a circumstance where I'm not ready to fill the dehydrator and I need to delay some time. Mm -hmm. You can put them in a, hopefully a paper bag because it won't increase the humidity um, and then leave it in the fridge for like a day um, or, you know, however long to delay it, it'll slow it. Um, but I would not recommend long-term storage in the fridge um, or some people use the freezer, but I would say if you're doing that, just really make sure that whatever you're storing it in is airtight because it'll get condensation otherwise and that will zap the potency pretty quick. Oh, and as far as Amanita, um, yeah, I, Amanita has different alkaloids. It works on your different parts of your system. And there are, so within the genus Amanita, there are many different species. 
And so Amanita muscaria or fly agaric, it's like the Mario mushroom. Um, that one contains several alkaloids, one of them being ibotenic acid. Ibotenic acid has been um, shown to be upsetting to the stomach. It can be not so well received in people. And so there's some question as to the toxicity of it, but when dried properly, you can actually convert the ibotenic acid. And so it doesn't make you quite as sick, hopefully. Um, and so, and, and that's when it can, can become, have like medicinal prop properties there. Um, so, but there are within that same genus of Amanita, there are deadly mushrooms. And so you don't want to misidentify one and end up wrong and dead. So um, it's definitely important. And there's tons of lookalikes that could make you really stomach upset or sick. And so I think a lot of it's misidentification. I think a little bit of it is um, a lot of lately it's changing, but I think that we're more mushroom phobic in the USA than we are. There's other cultures that embrace the Amanita and have a rich history of using it. So let's do this because I know, um, I think in the original material, I said that we were going to go ahead and also talk about Amanita muscaria tonight, but I think that that really is such an interesting mushroom. And I know um, Janelle, with your help, Dr. Denise and I have a, a pretty good, a decent amount of ex at least beginning experience with it now. And I'd like to really make that a, a separate class because I think it's something that really deserves um, a good amount of time to talk about because there are um, a lot of interesting things about it. Plus, um, it is it is legal. It's totally in the United States. I believe it's totally legal. So it's something not in Louis not in Louisiana. Oh, I take I didn't know. But I don't I don't know that there's anyone like I was just saying not in Louisiana. It's not legal in Louisiana for some reason. But I don't know that there's anyone really enforcing that. Okay, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize it was not in Louisiana, but I guess it's pretty safe to say the rest of the U.S. it is legal, and it's it's such an interesting mushroom that can be used therapeutically as well. So I think that that kind of deserves its own its own class, which we'll do. Um, if you want to come back, Janelle, and do another one with us at some point, we, we'd love to love to do that. We're winding down, so I'm going to go ahead and give. One, I've got another question that I think is it, it's a pretty cool one from Lisa, and and. It, it asks a little bit like what you touched on before, because Janelle, you said that you um, you've had chocolates that you've taken, you've consumed after at least after a year. And they still seem from what you said, I, I, I took that to mean that um, they still seem just as potent as day one. I also I'm a big fan of chocolate. I just think it's it's easy. Um, it tastes good. Um, and it also is it's very easy to store. So I, um, but Lisa's asking, should I keep chocolate in the fridge now? I can answer. I personally do not. I keep it just in a in a cool, dry area, but I, I don't keep it in the fridge. But what's what is your feeling? Will that help at all, or not, or not help keeping chocolate in the fridge? So chocolate, um, just to be, I had mushrooms that were a year old that seemed okay. I've had chocolate that's been like six to eight months old, I think, just for experiment, and that was fine too. But they say that chocolate's actually one of the best ways to like preserve mushrooms because what you're doing is you're coating them so they're not exposed to the air. And the the air is like mostly what does the degradation. And so as long as you're storing it appropriately, I again would probably avoid the fridge unless you're sure it's in like a airtight situation um, or condensation could still get to it a little bit. Although because there's less actual mushrooms exposed to the air, maybe not as much. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Denise, go ahead. Why don't we do, um, Denise, why don't you go ahead and take another question, then we'll go ahead and start wrapping. Uh, well, I, I just actually wanted to follow up on what you just said. It was related to a question, but it's it's sort of, uh, it's my question that I'm not going to put in the question and answer because <laughs> I didn't just ask it, um, which is about the, you know, preserving and, you know, is is what I'm about to say true, that it it, it doesn't really... Um, it's not like they'll go bad. Like if you have them and you store them properly, they might not be as potent. Um, but like the sort of contamination, if not stored a certain way, I mean, it is if like there's like a, like if there's moisture, an issue. But like I store, I use those desiccant packets, packs, packets in everything. I don't put anything in the refrigerator. I have powder. I don't use the chocolate, although I'm going to start using chocolates. Um, and so, you know, it, it does the, is there any effect or problem storing something with like the desiccant 
package, uh, you know, those little tiny desiccant things that we all get, um, you know, and, and because that sort of removes the moisture and it doesn't really sort of break it down. And then the part two of the chocolate is, is it, you know, when you're taking it with chocolate, we know that cacao is a, is a bit of a dilation kind of, like it helps with the sort of metabolizing of the, you know, in addition to coating the, and protecting the mushrooms. Um, so yeah, if you could comment on both of that, I know I threw a lot in there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of the desiccant packs, those are definitely great to store with the mushrooms because they do um, prevent moisture really from getting to it. Even, you know, if you think it's fine, like your air has a relative humidity in it. And so you have that getting to your mushrooms. If you leave your mushrooms out outside of a Ziploc bag for a day or something, you're going to come back and you can bend them because they've absorbed moisture. Um, when it comes to, I didn't really touch on the the degradation of potency. Um, I believe there's a few studies saying like within three to four to five months or so, you start to see a little bit of a drop, but there's not like a huge significant drop until a year and then beyond that. Um, and in terms of them going bad, as long as they're kept without moisture, you're right. Like they shouldn't mold or anything. As long as they're dry, they should be fine. Um, and then... I'm sorry, your, your second question, <laughs> can you remind me? The, um, the, the sort of role of combining chocolate with oh. taking that it's a, because chocolate is like, you know, a bit of a opening up. Yes, exactly. Um, so chocolate is really synergistic. Um, the Aztecs actually used to have uh, chocolate and psilocybin ceremonies. And so that inspires me when I'm, when I started microdosing, I was like mixing my microdoses with cacao um, and the cacao and chocolate does also interact with the psilocybin. So they're both uh, serotonin agonist, which is why people say like chocolate can put you in a good mood too. Um, and so that has a nice synergy. Uh, cacao is also a vascular dilator. And so I've read what that means in terms of pairing it with psilocybin that it, you're you're increasing your uptake and like you um basically the psilocybin is more accessible to more parts of your body and the effects tend to last a little longer than if you were not pairing it with something like that that's synergistic perfect um i'll tell you we could, we've got a lot more questions and we could go on and on probably for hours but we did promise everybody that the class would be only one hour then we'd let you out for sunday evening to do whatever else you want but um this has been super it's been incredible and and if you did ask a question and we were not not able to get to it i really apologize we try to get it to as many as possible but um janelle um since we have so many questions and, and we also want to talk about um, Amanita muscaria in a separate class, would you, would you like to come back at some point pretty soon? And we can do that. I love Amanita. I would love to talk about Amanita or really any mushrooms for that nature. Um, but especially Amanita, I personally have been using it for years. So, yep, let's do it. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, Amanita would be a great topic. And like I said, Dr. Denise and I just recently started um, experimenting with it a little bit. And I, I, I'm, I'm at first, at very, at first I wasn't so keen, but, uh, cause I had a little weird experience, which we'll talk about on the, in the next class if we, if we do that. But, um, but since then it's been, um, to me, extremely calming. And I, I really yeah. talk more about this. So let, let's do that. So, um, so first of all, I want to go ahead and thank, um, our entire Nakama for being here tonight. Anybody that took time out on a Sunday evening, wherever you are in the world and uh, wherever your time zone is, maybe it's not evening exactly, but um, close enough. Um, really, we really, really appreciate you being with us. It, me it means a lot for our Nakama. And those of you that are brand new to Microdose U, uh, Nakama is a word in in Japanese. It means it's kind of like it's, it's a combination of like um, family, tribe, colleagues, compatriots people that are all together getting all together and we kind of help each other with energy feed off of each other and just and just um it's a it's a wonderful thing that we're all together on this so um really means a lot that you guys are all here appreciate that a lot um i want to thank um dr denise and also of course janelle for coming here and the denise is, is usually on the webinars with me but you know uh, janelle this is her first time as a guest and um it just it was great so Thanks, thanks to both of you. How about if we give each of you like a little bit of a 
final word. Denise, you go first and then Janelle. And Janelle, you, when you give your final word, you can also let people know how to contact you if they have any more questions. So go ahead, Denise, you go first. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave, and for having all of this and Janelle for coming and everybody. I mean, we have always have such a, a, a great number of participants, fantastic questions. And we always encourage people, you know, if your question didn't an get answered, certainly reach out to us. Um, and, you know, there's it, it's ongoing. We're going to have another webinar. Usually we do it about once a month. So you'll get those announcements. And um, you know, just so glad for all the information. I found this incredibly informative. So thank you very much, Janelle. Absolutely. Thank thank you both, of course, for you know entertaining this and putting this on and you know getting getting hopefully some misinformation kind of dispelled here. And um, you know, and really the, my end what my end thing is like, you know, as long as you have safe access to your mushrooms, it doesn't really matter like what strain or you, you know what type or you know really they're like varieties and isolations of the same thing that is has been studied to do the same things um so let's hope maybe more information comes out in the future about the specific minor alkaloids but and still until then keep microdosing with whatever you have safe access to and you can find me uh, if you have specific questions for me, blue mood food uh, at gmail.com or blue mood food two on Instagram. If you want to see some pictures of the mushrooms I grow. Yep. That would be great. Thank you so much. And again, um, Nakama, we love you. We couldn't be doing this without, without you. Otherwise we'd just be speaking into the mic and, and camera not going anywhere. So we appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks again so much for taking your time out. We will be doing this. As Denise said, we'll, uh, we're trying to do one of these a month because they're just um, they're getting a lot of attention and people seem to really like kind of the live the live classroom atmosphere. And Microdose U has some empty classrooms. So we want to um, go ahead and make these available to you in the evenings. So again, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Uh, I'll send everybody an email out that was here and uh, you'll get to uh, a link to be able to watch this um, at a future time. And um, I think that's it. Um, I, I, at the end of all my podcast episodes, I, I say, I love you. And I, I really mean that from my heart. So I'm going to say it tonight. I love you all. And um, we will talk to you soon. Good night.